Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of ISTA to this year's ÖAV ISTA lecture. It will be delivered by Jan Lecun and is titled From Machine Learning to Autonomous Intelligence. But first, a brief in, in, uh, introduction to the Institute. The Institute of Science and Technology Austria, or for short, ISTA, as we call it. ISTA is a public research institution dedicated to basic research and graduate education in the physical, mathematical, computer, and life sciences. ISTA was established in 2006 by the federal government of Austria and the province of Lower Austria. The campus opened here in 2009, hence we are a rather young institute. But from the outset, we have been committed strictly to cutting edge science and a doctoral program that recruits globally. Today, we're the home of 70 research groups, a global community of over 1,000 employees, and a scientific infrastructure that is truly state of the art. And there's still a lot of construction on campus. We're on a path to more than double in size to 150 groups over the next 15 years. We also have here at least five groups whose research is quite vested in the area of today's talk in machine learning. And uh, this is what we'll hear about today. But first, before I introduce Jan, let me just say a few words about the lecture series. This is the seventh, actually, in the series of lectures we are hosting together with our partner, the Austrian Academy of Sciences, beginning in 2016. And this lecture is, series is focused on bringing some of the most brilliant active scientists to Austria. And I'm therefore very happy to have Jan and have all of you here with us today. Also with us today is a group of young audience members. That's an initiative of ISTA's science education team, which brings uh, high school students to campus for these uh, ISTA lectures to listen to our esteemed speakers. And I'm sure you all agree it's time that we begin to wrap our heads around this thing called artificial intelligence. New worlds are about to be opened, not only for our young colleagues, but also for each one of us. And like AI, also we have to continue learning. So before I introduce the speaker, I would like to invite the Vice President of the Austrian Academy of Sciences, Ulrike Diebold, to also welcome you on behalf of our partner, the Austrian Academy and say a few words about. Thank you very much, much Tom, um, dear Jan, everyone. Very well, warm welcome from the Austrian Academy of Science to the seventh ERV ISTA lecture. Um, I want to say a few words, if you allow me, about the Austrian Academy of Sciences. It was a, a, in contrast to ISTA, we are a relatively old society. It was founded in 1847. It has presently over 760 members. As a learned society, the academy consists of two divisions of humanities and social sciences and the division of mathematics and natural sciences as well as a young academy. Young means under the age of 40 or so. Um, the Austrian Academy of Sciences also operates 25 research institutes in the field of basic research in the arts, humanities, social sciences, natural sciences. Our academy is also especially committed to the sustainable support of promising young talents. For example, we support highly qualified young scholars from beyond our institutes for, with uh, fellowships and prizes. <laughs> Well, to our joint lecture series, Tom has already mentioned the idea behind this lecture. And uh, so far we had an incredible lineup that has continued today. So since 2016, we had David Gross, Christiane nüsslein Vollhardt, Martin Heirer, Bernhard Schöllkopf, and Angelica Mohn, Eamon, who sadly, sadly passed away a few weeks after her talk and, talk and last year, Karen Badozzi. Um, all these lectures were a great success, and I'm sure it will be one to do as well, so we very much look forward to your talk to Diane. And Tom, if you could introduce. Thank you, Ulrike. And now uh, I get to introduce our speaker. Uh, for many of you, he actually needs no introduction as he's a 
truly seminal figure, not only in ongoing research, but also in what we now call the brief history of humankind's foray into artificial intelligence. So Jan is vice president and chief AI scientist at Meta and silver professor at NYU, New York University, affiliated with the Courant Institute, the Center for Data Science, the Center for Neural Science, and the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. He was in fact the founding director of Facebook AI Research and of the NYU Center for Data Science. In 2018, Jan received the ACM Turing Award together with Jeffrey Hinton and Joshua Benjo for conceptual and engineering breakthroughs that have made deep neural networks a critical component of computing. I'm sure that all of you know that the ACM Turing Award is the closest equivalent to the Nobel Prize in computer science, which didn't exist when Alfred Nobel dedicated his prizes. Um, Jan's research includes, of course, AI, machine learning, computer perception, and computational neuroscience. He was one of the pioneers and founding fathers of neural networks. And the most impressive thing, I think, is actually that Jan worked on neural networks when it was not popular to work on neural networks. Uh, now, this is a prime example that actually one's own scientific convictions as a scientist are much more important than today's fashion and winning today's fashion contest. So I hope we hear a bit about that aspect of your work. So he, he is the father particularly of, convolutional, uh, of the convolutional network model, which is the basis of many products and services you use today for image and video understanding, document and speech recognition in particular. The character recognition technology he developed at Bell Labs uh, was used by several banks around the world to read checks and was reading actually between 10 and 20% of all checks in the US at some time. His image compression uh, technology is used by hundreds of websites and uh, publishers and millions of users uh, to access scanned documents uh, on the web. Jan is a member of the US National Academies of the Sciences and Engineering and of the French Academy of, and of the French Legion of Honor, the highest French order of merit, actually. He received uh, his degrees in electrical engineering, first at the Ecole Supérieure d'Ingénieur, and then a PhD in computer science at Sorbonne in Paris. And after a postdoc at the University of Toronto, he joined AT&T Bell Labs in 1988, where he became head of the image processing uh, department, research department, and afterwards he joined NYU as a professor in 2003. Today, Jan will tell us how could machines learn as efficiently as humans and animals, and how could machines learn to reason and to plan. Please join me in today's speaker. Thank you, Tom and Ulrike, for the introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's a very diverse audience, going from first-year high school students to experts and researchers, established researchers in AI and machine learning. So I'm going to try to uh, cater to this wide spectrum, but uh, don't be scared if some parts are boring for you or some parts are just too challenging for you. Um, I th hopefully, there will be a little bit for everyone. Now, I have to say something about, about ISTA. You know, ISTA also is the name of an algorithm. It means iterative shrinkage and thresholding algorithm. It's uh, the main algorithm used for, uh, for sparse coding. I don't know if you knew that, but uh, <laughs> that was my first exposure to the name ISTA. Um, okay, uh, so when we, when we hear, we've been hearing about AI now, you, you know, very widely over the, over the last 10 years, uh, certainly a lot more over the last 10 years than before that. Uh, and the reason we've been hearing about it is uh, because of something called supervised learning. Uh, so that's an example. So basically machine learning is the idea that instead of programming a computer to do something, you train it to do that thing. And you train it from examples. So let's say we want to have a machine that can distinguish images of uh, cars from images of airplanes. We collect thousands of images of cars and thousands of images of airplanes, 
And we build this machine. It's a program on the computer, but it's a machine that has, it's a system that has lots of adjustable parameters symbolized by the knobs that you see on this, uh, this actually an analog synthesizer for music, but no matter. So there's knobs that you can adjust, and those knobs will determine the input-output function of, uh, of, of, that, of that system. Those knobs correspond to numbers represented in the memory of the computer, and I'll come in, uh, I'll tell you in some detail what they correspond to. But basically, the way you train the machine is that you show it an image, an image of a car. If the system answers car, turns on the light that says car, um, you do nothing. If it says something else on car, then you adjust all the parameters in the machine so that the output gets closer to the one you want. Uh, and then you show an image of an airplane and you adjust the parameters a little bit, and then a car, and you adjust a little bit. And if you keep doing this for millions of images, uh, the system will eventually settle on a, on a configuration of the knobs so that it will give you the right answer for almost all of the images that you train it on. And the magic of machine learning is that it will also give you the correct answer for images you've never uh, showed to the, to the system during training. Uh, as long as those images kind of are somewhat similar to, to the one that you, you showed during training. So that system might be able to recognize any car or any airplane uh, after, after training. So this process of supervised learning works really well if you have lots of data, and if the data has been annotated by humans, right? So there's a, a person that collected the, the, the images, and, and then uh, a set of person went and, and labeled the images as to whether it's a car, an airplane, or something else. This works really well to translate speech into words for speech recognition. Uh, almost every one of us now has used a speech recognition system to talk to Amazon Alexa or Google Home or whatever it's called. Um, um, and you know, speech recognition is used very widely on social networks to generate automatically subtitles on videos so you can watch them silently. Uh, Etc. It works really well also for um, uh, things like generating captions for photos, um, figuring out the topic of a piece of text, uh, and, and even for translation. So, very successful approach. Uh, but it's not the kind of learning that we observe in animals and humans, and so I'll come back to this in a, in a minute. Uh, so mathematically, what supervised learning really is, is uh, basically a uh, the problem of finding the minimum of a function. So you measure, for every example you show the system, you measure the, the distance between the, or divergence, some, some measure of distance uh, between the output you want, that encodes the label, and the output the machine produces. Okay, so that's an error term. Uh, if the system produces the correct answer, that error is zero, or very close to zero. And then you compute the average of that over the thousands or millions of images, training images that you have, uh, and that gives you a number. Now you're gonna get a different number for every different setting of the parameters in the machine. And you can think of this, we're in Austria, right? So the Alps are, are nearby. Um, so you can think of this as some sort of landscape in the mountains. So the height, the altitude at which you are corresponds to this cost the average error that the system makes, okay? And the position where you are, um, your latitude and longitude, corresponds to a setting of two parameters, okay? So let's imagine our machine only has two parameters. Uh, when you adjust those two parameters, you adjust one parameter, you move from north to south, and you adjust the other one, you move from east to west, and you can tell if uh, the landscape goes down or goes up, right? So uh, the problem of machine learning is to find the bottom of the valley what setting of the parameters will take me to the bottom of the valley uh, so that the, the average cost is the, is the smallest, which means the machine gives me the, the correct answer most of the time, right? So the, the way you do this is by computing what's called a gradient. So what's a gradient? It's basically the direction where that points downwards. Uh, it's actually the direction that points upwards, but you invert it and that's the direction that points downward. So you can turn around and, and see which direction goes downward and then you take a step, and then you repeat the process, take a step, and as you keep going, if the mountain is smooth, which is not the case for the Alps, um, you will eventually converge to the valley at the bottom, okay? Or you might get stuck in a, in a lake or something, but if you're lucky, you'll go down to the valley. Okay, so this process 
of figuring out which, which way it points down and taking a step, that's called gradient descent. And there's a particular form of it used in machine learning called stochastic gradient descent, which I'm not going to go through. Uh, but, but basically, this, this little diagram that you can see here is the, is the, uh, the, 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 the trajectory. Uh, this, this little diagram here is the trajectory followed by the, the two parameters here to get to the bottom, the bottom of, the, uh, of the valley. Um, and because the estimate of the gradient that we're getting is, is noisy, uh, it, it gets this kind of oscillations, but that's, that's something we need to worry about for now. So basically, we need uh, two components. We need, uh, we need three components. We need a training set. We need a parameterized function that depends on the set of parameters that we're going to adjust. For a given input x, the system will produce a, a predicted output, uh, y bar. And then we measure the cost of uh, that output uh, through some cost function. And the name of the game is to figure out the setting of values, so the, the values of w that will minimize this cost. So this w here is a long list of numbers, okay, which are the positions of all the knobs. Now, in the, the previous uh, diagram I showed you here, there's uh, only a few, a few dozen knobs. In a real machine learning system, there can be millions, hundreds of millions, even hundreds of billions of knobs to adjust. And this is what we put in the G function. So what, what do we put in this box? That's the next question. And what has become quite successful, um, the idea for this goes back to the 1950s, and there was a period of interest in such system called neural nets in the late 80s to the mid, to the mid 90s. Uh, and then sort of interest uh, dropped. Uh, nobody was working on this uh, from the mid-90s to the mid-2000. And then sort of uh, interest kind of revived. And then there's been a complete explosion of uh, interest in those models since uh, 2010, 2012, roughly. So what is a neural network? A neural network, uh, so it has, it has neural in the name uh, because it's kind of inspired by, uh, by, by neurons in the brain. Okay, so the brain is, uh, is composed of, the human brain is composed of roughly 86 billion neurons. If you're younger, probably more. If you're my age, probably less. Um, 86 billion neurons, roughly, uh, which are interconnected with several thousand other neurons. And the, the neurons themselves are extremely simple. And so intelligence is an emergent property of a network of lots and lots of very simple elements. And this concept is, uh, an incredible concept, the fact that you can have something as complex as human intelligence emerge from a network of, of simple, simple elements. So people have been trying to kind of reproduce those, those, uh, those properties since the 1950s. Uh, but really, it started working roughly around the, the late 80s and, and then working really well around 2010 or so. Um, so what is a, a neuron? So a simulated neuron is a very simple element which uh, basically computes a weighted sum of its inputs. Okay, so you get a bunch of inputs. And that's uh, a simple neuron. It computes a weighted sum of its inputs, and the weights are the knobs that I was talking about earlier. So this is what we're going to adjust. It's the weights with which we compute the weighted sum uh, uh, of those inputs. And then we pass this weighted sum through a nonlinear uh, element. Uh, here it's called a value. So it's a, a function like this that is equal to the identity when the argument is uh, positive and zero when the argument is negative. So it's an elementary threshold, if you, if you want. Real neurons behave a bit like this, but not exactly. And real neurons uh, do something like this, but not exactly either. OK, so uh, uh, the weighted sum is just the sum over all the neurons preceding the neuron i uh, of wij, which is the weight from, neural, uh, from, from neuron j to neuron i of zj, which is the uh, output of neuron j. OK, so you can implement this with a very short program in uh, whatever language you're programming in. Uh, a complex neural net can be programmed, if, you're not, if you don't care about efficiency and things like this, in basically half a page of code. It's very, very simple. All the intelligence and the, the complexity of the system resides in the value of those weights. And this is what the learning algorithm is going to uh, compute for us. OK, so we build neural nets by connecting all those uh, neurons together. We're going to have millions of them. And then we have to figure out. Um, we have a cost function, and we want to minimize this cost function. So tweak the weights uh, so that the uh, tweak the weights here so that the error goes down. And this is done by uh, something called the backpropagation procedure. So 
don't be scared by the formula here. You don't have to actually uh, read them. Uh, but if you, can, if you understand what they are, it's useful to read them. And it's basically chain rule. So for those of you who know what a derivative is, there is this rule that allows you to compute the derivative of a function applied to another function, right? Uh, that's called chain rule in English. There must be a German name for it. Uh, there's a different name in French, but I don't know what the German name is. Um, and that's what we're going to use. So basically, uh, what we're trying to figure out is uh, when, when we tweak a particular parameter somewhere inside the network, we have to know the effect of tweaking this parameter on the, on the cost function, which is denoted by L here. And to do this, what we can do is propagate some signals backwards, so those, those, those gradient uh, signals, using uh, this uh, chain rule, uh, uh, rule uh, which you can see on the, uh, here, and it's called backpropagation because those signals propagate backwards uh, in, the, in the network in uh, kind of the opposite direction of the signals that propagate through the network to compute the output. Um, so, um, so that works amazingly well, and, um, um, and again, the basic procedure is you show an input, together with the desired output, you compute the, the cost here, and then you backpropagate the gradient, so you compute the, the output from the input, compute the cost, then backpropagate the gradient, so you get basically for every parameter, every knob in your system, you get a quantity that tells you by how much the cost would decrease if you tweak the the weight by, by some infinitesimal uh, uh, amount, okay? So now you tweak all the weights by a small amount, and then you go to the next, uh, the next training sample and do it again, and after a few million of that, uh, your system will hopefully have learned how to map the input to the output. Okay, so that's backpropagation and the basics of, uh, of neural nets and, and deep learning. Uh, so why is it called deep learning? It's called deep learning simply because uh, those systems are generally composed of a stack of modules that do those weighted sums and nonlinearities and perhaps some more complex functions. And because there are several, several of them that are stacked, uh, it's deep. Okay, it's as simple as that. This is by opposition to previous approaches to machine learning where basically there was only one layer of those things that was uh, tunable. Okay, and then the, um, how are we going to use this for, for, for anything? So um, then we, you can get a little more inspiration from, from neuroscience and biology. Uh, and for example, this gentleman here in the center, so these guys are called uh, Hubel and, and, and Wiesel. They uh, uh, investigated how the visual cortex in, in, in mammals uh, processes uh, visual information and made some proposals for how the neurons are connected with each other and what type of uh, uh, motifs they detect uh, on the input. They actually, uh, so the, this work goes back to the late 50s, early 60s. They eventually uh, got a Nobel Prize for this. It's very classic work in neuroscience about the architecture of the visual cortex. And uh, their work was picked up by this gentleman here, Kunihiko Fukushima, uh, in Japan. He was uh, working for the national TV in Japan. Um, uh, and they had a research lab, and he built a, a model that was inspired by what Hubel and Wiesel suggested, and he applied it to the problem of uh, recognizing uh, handwritten characters. But he did this in the late uh, 70s, early 80s, and he, he did not have um, access to backpropagation because backpropagation hadn't been popularized yet. And so he didn't use backpropagation to train his system, and his system was kind of a little brittle for that, for that reason. But he, he kind of pioneered this idea that you can architect the, neur the neurons in a neural net uh, according to uh, what we know of the structure of the visual cortex. So when you look at a, at a scene, you're looking at um, the screen now, uh, an image forms in, the, in your retina, it goes to uh, different areas, uh, mostly in the back of your brain, uh, the uh, uh, V1, V2, V4, so those are uh, areas with lots of neurons that are interconnected with each other, and then the posterior and anterior uh, uh, infotemporal cortex, and this is where object categories are represented. So it takes about a tenth of a second, about 100 milliseconds, for the signal to go from here to here, and after 100 milliseconds, you, you, you've identified the, the main objects uh, in the scene, if you want, and, it's, uh, and they are represented here. So there is this idea that the, 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 uh, the signal propagates really, really quickly, uh, through the visual cortex and basically does not require a lot of thinking or reasoning. It's basically what's called a feed-forward process where 
the, the, the signal propagates uh, directly from input to output. It, it's a lot more complicated than this in reality, and we don't understand everything, but to first order, that's kind of what happens. Um, so um, what I did in the late 80s was to uh, basically get inspiration from Hubble and Rizzo and from Fukushima and build a, a neural net model trained with backpropagation that sort of tried to reproduce some of the characteristics of the visual cortex. And that's what's called a convolutional neural network. Uh, convolutional because that's a mathematical term, a convolution. I'll, I'll come to this in a second. Every one of you has played with convolution without, possibly without knowing it, but, uh, or most likely knowing it, um, given the audience. So what's, uh, uh, so what's the idea that comes from Huber and Wiesel? Uh, what they uh, discovered is that every neuron in the V1, for example, the primary visual cortex area, looks at a sort of... Uh, patch, if you want, a small neighborhood in your visual field. And what uh, all neurons in V1 will do is detect a particular motif at a particular location. And what they also discovered is that if you have a neuron that detects this motif at one location in the visual field, you're going to have another identical neuron that detects the same motif in a different part of the image. Uh, so basically, uh, that's what we try to reproduce here with convolutional nets. You take a uh, a patch of, of pixels here, which are, you know, values in a computer, right? Uh, dark is one and uh, white is minus one, for example, or zero. And then you compute the weighted sum of those pixels by those weights, and that gives you this value. And then you take the same weights and apply it to another window, and then another window, and then another window, uh, as if you were simulating those neurons that basically perform the same operation on different parts of the image. And so what you get is a system that can detect a motif wherever it appears uh, on the input. Uh, so take an image, apply a particular uh, set of weights to it, and you get, uh, as a result, some sort of image representing the input but detecting particular motifs. In this case, actually, it's a vertical edge. Uh, and then you'll have another one here that detects another motif, another one that detects another motif, another one that detects another motif. But we're not going to hardwire the weights here, we're going to run them through backpropagation. So uh, we're going to propagate the signal through the entire network and backpropagate gradients so that we can adjust the weights at every layer uh, in such a way that the output gets closer to the one we want. So a convolutional net has two tricks. The first trick is this uh, convolution operation here. Uh, and the second trick is what's called a pooling. So that corresponds to what Hubble and Weasel uh, call complex cells. And what the pooling uh, does is that it takes uh, values within the neighborhood uh, of the output of the, the first operation, and then it, uh, it kind of aggregates them. It computes the average, or the sum of the square, or the maximum value, or one of those things. Um, and then we, uh, we step that, that window by more than one pixel, so we get uh, a map that is lower resolution as the original image. Uh, and then we repeat, we repeat the, those operations. So again, we do convolutions. We uh, add up the result, we pass the result through a nonlinearity, uh, one of those values I was talking about earlier. We pool, and so every time the resolution diminishes, but the, the number of features that we extract increases, and so we get a rep uh, some sort of abstract representation of the image as we go up the layers. And this is an example. So this is a type of neural net that I trained you know, back in the early, early 1990s. Uh, and what you see here is that every pixel is the activation of a particular neuron inside of this uh, neural net this convolutional net, where this is the first layer, uh, second layer after pooling, third layer, uh, fourth layer after pooling, and then uh, fifth layer, there is another couple layers uh, until you get the output here, which I didn't represent. But what this shows is that the representation that is being extracted by the system uh, is somewhat robust to changes in position and scale. This was a huge problem in pattern recognition in the early days, which is that um, if you change the, the shape a little bit, the representation will change completely and the system will not be able to recognize a, different, a tree in a different style or a different size or slanted in a different way. So uh, convolutional net basically allowed to uh, train you know, a system end-to-end -to, -end to do this recognition uh, with a lot of robustness. And there are various videos on the web of me demonstrating those systems back in the early 90s that are kind of fun. Now what happened in, uh, in the early 2010s, uh, around 2012, is that uh, our friends at University of Toronto, where I did my postdoc, uh, in Jeff Hinton's group, Alex Krzyzewski, Ilya Siskever, and Jeff Hinton, uh, built a very large uh, convolutional net, very much of the same type that 
uh, I've, been, I've been talking about, except much bigger, uh, more layers, uh, higher resolution input. And they applied it to uh, recognizing objects and images using a data set called ImageNet, which was produced a few years earlier. And ImageNet was really seen as the benchmark for computer vision. Uh, the best systems at the time, which were not using neural nets, were getting uh, something like 26% error, according to sort of the, be the, the way the system the performance was measured. That system got, got this down to 16% error, which was such a huge jump that the entire vision community, basically most people within two years abandoned whatever they were doing and switched to using neural nets. And it, it's really sort of created a revolution uh, in, in uh, computer vision. A similar uh, revolution occurred in speech recognition a couple of years earlier. So by 2010, 11, when you were speaking to your phone, uh, it, it, was, it was a neural net that was interpreting your, your voice and tra transcribing it into text. Uh, same for Amazon Alexa. Whereas just two years before, it was, it was not a neural net. It was uh, a kind of a preview generation system, if you want. And that really brought about a huge uh, improvement. Uh, as a result, AI can do pretty amazing things today uh, because there, there, there's been a, a huge uh, amount of interest in those methods because you know, they could be used for all kinds of stuff. And so there's been a, enormous investments by uh, large uh, tech companies and all kinds of companies, many startups, et cetera. And you know, there are a lot of applications that many of you, I'm sure, are, are, have heard about. So things like uh, driving assistance and autonomous driving is you know, not completely working yet, but getting close. Uh, but certainly autonomous driving, uh, I mean, uh, driving assistance, every car in Europe now that is sold in Europe has to have a driving assistance system, almost all of them are based on convolutional neural nets. And they reduce collisions by 40%, which means it's a technology that saves lives. Um, uh, a lot of uh, use, usage in online safety and security for filtering harmful or, or hateful content and uh, dangerous misinformation. Uh, environmental monitoring, a lot of uh, applications. There is now applications on mobile phones where you can take a picture of the the tail of a whale and, and, and the system will tell you this is George. Uh, it will recognize the individual whale based on the shape of the tail. Uh, you can also point it at a, at a plant and it will tell you the species of the plant from the, the shape of the, of the leaves or an insect or a bird or whatever. Uh, and of course, a lot of applications in medicine, in medical imaging, in uh, uh, diag diagnostic assistance, patient care and, and drug discovery, which is sort of a really exciting new, new field. Uh, this is an example from some of my colleagues at NYU who have been using uh, convolutional nets for detecting uh, tumors in mammograms, uh, so, so bre uh, breast cancer. And also another group here at, at uh, NYU in collaboration with FAIR, uh, uh, META, uh, for uh, accelerating the process of collecting uh, uh, MRI images. But the biggest use of uh, deep learning today is, uh, uh, is you know, for things like online services, search engines, social networks, et cetera. Uh, ad, ad ranking also. Um, so if you take uh, Meta, so Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, uh, Google, YouTube, Amazon, all of those companies now are completely built around deep learning. You take deep learning, if you try to rip deep learning out of them, the companies crumble. They're completely built around it. Um, and what deep learning does is not just do things like recognize uh, uh, you know, speech or you know, understands intent uh, you know, when you talk to your, your uh, smart speaker or whatever. Um, they can also do translation, but the main thing they do is content filtering. So things like uh, uh, you type a search on Google and the result that Google will show you depend on First of all, what your personal interests are, but also a lot on the quality of the content and whether other people kind of like the results. Um, uh, ranking, question answering, you can ask questions directly on, on Google and, and things like that. So that requires machines to understand content. Um, and it's very useful also because it would be useful f to give access to digital technology to a lot of people who basically don't have it at the moment, either because they are illiterate, there's 800 million illiterate people in the world today, um, or because they're visually impaired. And so if you have a system that can just uh, speak or uh, a text and understand your speech, um, that's, that's quite useful, and tell you the content of an image, uh, that's quite useful. 
Okay, online content moderation, probably the biggest uh, use of, uh, of, of, of deep learning and machine learning today, uh, more generally. So th there's two questions really, what constitutes acceptable or objectionable content? Uh, and this is a very difficult question that most tech companies actually would like to not have to do, but they have to. Um, so Meta, for example, doesn't see itself as having the leg legitimacy to decide what is acceptable or not acceptable. But in the absence of regulation, it has to decide by itself. And uh, people may or may not like it, and it depends which country you're in, um, etc. For example, in European countries, um, uh, in many European countries, uh, you can't claim that the Holocaust did not exist. That's illegal. Uh, not so in the US. But that actually is taken down. Uh, uh, this type of, uh, of claim is taken down by, by Facebook worldwide. So, um, for example, if you take hate speech, uh, the automated system uh, at Facebook that try to understand uh, text uh, take down uh, roughly between 95 and 96% of all hate speech uh, preemptively. So uh, it's detected automatically by, by uh, an AI system and it decides to just take down the content. Sometimes there are mistakes. So sometimes good content is taken down and shouldn't have. Uh, and sometimes some bad content is let through and that's the remaining 3.4%. And those are generally flagged by users and then examined by human moderators and taken down subsequently. Now, if you go back to uh, just three or four years ago, four years ago, this number was around between 30 and 40%. So the progress of AI just over the last three years has been such that uh, there's been enormous progress in content moderation. Uh, and uh, this, this makes a, a huge difference, actually. Um, and I'll talk about what those technologies are. Uh, you know, and there's you know, similar numbers for all kinds of uh, other sort of unacceptable content and for things like, you know, terrorist propaganda, you know, fake accounts, spam, etc. Um, you can read all about this here if you want. But really one of the most impressive applications of, uh, of deep learning has been in uh, computer vision. So this is a, a, a video that was put together by my colleagues at FAIR in Menlo Park and it demonstrates the capabilities of the current vision system. Here is an uh, everyday scene. Uh, vision system basically can make, put a, a box around uh, every object. It can detect people and figure out what pose they are, you know, in 3D. Uh, and, and so figure out that you have two people kind of talking to each other, perhaps replace them by avatars. But what you can do now also is what's called instance segmentation. So basically label every pixel with the category of the object that it belongs to. So each of that, each of those things is a donut. That's a bowl, a bottle, blah, blah, blah. And, and this system basically can label the entire scene uh, that's called panoptic uh, instant segmentation. Uh, this is astonishing in terms of how well it works. Um, also, it's open source, so you can just download it. It's called Detectron 2. If you type that on, on Google, it will take you to a GitHub. You can just download it and play with it or retrain it if you want. And so this kind of technology has um, had like enormous impact in uh, which is still kind of progressing because it takes quite a few years to get a uh, medical image analysis system to, to be authorized uh, on the market. But, um, but it's been uh, really interesting work. So this is a collaboration between FAIR and uh, the NYU Radiology Department where they used uh, particular types of neural net to essentially reconstruct high quality images uh, from MRI from uh, basically low, low quality images that are co uh, collected um, uh, with uh, a four times uh, uh, reduction in the time you have to spend in the machine. So I don't know if any of you has had uh, MRI. I'm sure many of you have. You have to lie down in a machine, very noisy, uh, claustrophobic tube, uh, and uh, you have to lie down for 20 minutes or, or half an hour and not move, sometimes 40 minutes and not move. And this, will, this can reduce the amount of time you spend in the machine by a factor of four without degrading the quality of the image. Basically by exploiting the, the, the structure of, uh, of the data, and um, this uh, was published and you know, attracted the attention of uh, press and various other journals. And, uh, and what I see uh, uh, over the next few years is that uh, we're gonna have AI systems that ju don't simply kind of reconstruct images for human consumption, or don't simply sort of detect things like, like tumors, but actually work directly from the raw signal coming out of the MRI machine, for example. Uh, without having to produce an image for human consumption. And that would probably be a lot more reliable, actually, um, to some extent. Now, other uh, applications of uh, deep learning that 
I think are really astonishing are in the, the uh, in, domain, in uh, scientific domain. So things like neuroscience, so uh, neural nets now are basically our best model of what goes on in the visual cortex, and so neuroscientists use that as kind of a, a conceptual model of what goes on in the individual in, in perception. Uh, things like uh, uh, genomics um, and uh, biology and biochemistry. So the, there are several groups in the world now that can. Uh, so DeepMind AlphaFold is probably the most famous one that basically from uh, a sequence of amino acid can predict the, the shape of the protein. And there's a few groups now that are working on protein uh, synthesis so that you give them a shape, you give that system a shape and it, it produces a sequence that will take that shape when it folds. And that's really important because you can design drugs with this. You could design proteins that have a particular shape that will stick to a particular site. For example, the spike protein on the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 virus, uh, and disable it, uh, or, or things of that type. So there's, there's, there's potential for enormous applications of this over the next few years in uh, drug discovery. Um, uh, applications of this in, uh, as well in, in uh, material science and uh, high energy physics and physics more generally. Uh, but material science is particularly interesting. I'll, I'll come back to this. So um, uh, there's people at NYU, Harvard, and various other places that are using uh, deep learning to analyze the results of high energy physics experiments, uh, for example, at the LHC in uh, Geneva, uh, or to uh, accelerate the solution of uh, partial differential equations, which allow them to simulate the entire universe in the first instance, and then validate or invalidate some, some theory, some cosmological theories. So really interesting work there as well. Uh, but one of the most promising ones is in, um, is in material science, and this is a specialty that Ulrike is working on, <laughs> and we were just talking about this before, uh, where we could use a uh, deep learning system to basically predict the properties of a material or predict the reactivity of a particular compound. So this is a, a project called uh, Open Catalyst. So you type opencatalystproject.org. Uh, that was uh, put together by uh, some of my colleagues at FAIR, but it's a collaborative open project, uh, kind of open science. And what they do is that they use the big supercomputers that we have at FAIR to uh, essentially simulate uh, molecules uh, sticking with each other, particularly water molecules sticking to particular type of materials or compounds, and then figure out what the, you know, whether those compounds can be used as, as a catalyst to separate oxygen from hydrogen. Why is that an important problem to separate hydrogen from oxygen? Because if we could uh, separate hydrogen from, from oxygen uh, with electricity efficiently, we would basically solve climate change. Uh, so we would you know, cover a small desert with solar panels, and then uh, we, would, we could locally produce uh, hydrogen and then ship the hydrogen in the form of methane or whatever to wherever it's needed. Uh, whereas today we don't have technology to store energy. So whenever there is no, no sun or no wind, we have to use uh, either fossil fuels or nuclear uh, power, uh, preferably nuclear power because it doesn't spew any CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, but if we could store the energy, then the electrical energy and ship it wherever it's needed, then basically we wouldn't need fossil fuels anymore. So uh, huge potential payoff not clear it's going to work, but it's worth trying. And there's you know, similar uh, research in all kinds of domains in material science. Uh, a more sort of recent uh, thing that has happened also is the use of uh, deep learning for image synthesis. So this is a, a system that also coming out of FAIR, but there is a bunch of them. You can download one called Stable uh, Diffusion, which is a very interesting one. It's open source. Uh, uh, but this one, you. Uh, you can play with is, is, uh, is, from, is from FAIR. You, you give it a sketch, and then it sort of generates an image in a style that you decide as to what the sketch should look like. So those are examples of images generated uh, with that system. And a couple of months ago, I was talking to a bunch of physicists, and, um, and I, I played with it, and um, I typed a painting of a physicist on a mountainous path uh, watching the sunset in the style of Van Gogh, and that's what was generated, okay, I, I made a, like a very approximate drawing of someone and, and mountains in the back uh, before, before that, uh, and that's, that's what is generated. I guess this one looks a bit like Van Gogh, this, this one not, not so much. Okay, but um, here's the problem. Those systems are not that great because eventually we want AI systems to basically 
do things that they can do today. We want them to drive our cars completely autonomously. We want, we want them to help us in our daily lives as if we had a human assistant. So we want AI assistants that behave like human assistants, basically, right? So they need to understand us. They need to understand how the world works. They need to have some level of common sense. And uh, pretty soon, um, you know, we're not, you know, every one of us has one or two of those in our pocket. I have two. Uh, uh, in, 10, 15 years, we will not be carrying this in our pocket. We'll have augmented reality glasses that can overlay information on top of the world. Uh, and there will be assistants in living in those glasses that you can talk to or can interpret what you're doing and can remind you where you left your keys, things like that. Uh, uh, that's coming uh, pretty soon if we can solve the display technology. And so we'll need machines with common sense. There's no, there's no question if you want to expand the applicability of AI. And the problem is that machine learning sucks today. It's really not that great. Uh, pardon my French. Um, uh, certainly compared to human, humans and animals. And it's because supervised learning requires many, many samples, label samples. There is another type of learning called reinforcement learning, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. This is what, what is used to train systems to play uh, chess or Go or, or card games of various types. Um, and those require insane amounts of trials, m you know, many more than what humans require. And those systems are trained for a particular task. They tend to be uh, brittle because they are specialized. They make stupid mistakes, um, and they don't have common sense. The smartest AI systems today have less common sense than a cat, a street cat, a house cat. Um, and, and a house cat only has 800 million neurons. We have neural nets that are about that size today. Um, so animals and humans can learn new tasks very quickly. They understand how the world works, and they have common sense. How do we get machines to do this? Um, <clears throat> so there is something different about the way a lot of what we do uh, works and the way those uh, deep learning systems work, right? They, those deep learning systems, you, you feed them an input, and you run the signal through the layers, and after a fixed number of steps, they produce an output. But very often, humans and, and many animals actually can reason, right? If we want to, to accomplish a task, we plan a sequence of actions that will arrive at a, at a result, and the reason we can do this is that we have kind of a mental model of the world that allows us to predict what's gonna happen as a consequence of our actions. Um, we understand how the world works. We can predict the consequences of our actions. We can perform chains of reasoning with an unlimited number of steps. Uh, we can plan complex tasks by decomposing them into sequences of subtasks. Um, so that's a big question. How do animals and, and humans learn so quickly? So what happens is that babies, uh, and this is true for animals as well, uh, human babies learn basic concepts about the world in the first few months of life uh, at an incredible speed, and they accumulate enormous amounts of background knowledge about the work, about the world. So things like object permanence. So um, if I have an object and I hide it behind another one, you know it still exists. But babies don't know this. They learn this in the first two months of life or so. Um, things like, uh, very simple things, like the world is three-dimensional. The, the fact that there are uh, uh, kind of animate objects and inanimate objects. Uh, babies can uh, learn to make the difference around three months. And then things like, you know, natural categories of objects. You know, they don't necessarily speak or understand language at five months, but you can tell that, you know, a car is different from an airplane, is different from a table and, and, a, and a chair, even if they don't know the name of it. Uh, and certainly animals do this too. And then it takes about nine months or so to learn things like gravity. So if you show this little scenario here to, uh, you know, a six-month-old baby, uh, where a little car is on the platform and appears to float in the air as, as the car is pushed off the platform, a six-month-old baby will just not particularly pay attention to it. But a nine-month-old baby will go like this because a nine-month-old baby, she has learned that unsupported objects are supposed to fall and are subject to gravity. Um, and so that accumulated knowledge uh, is, is the thing that we don't know how to do with machines, although I'm going to offer you a few solutions that might work. But this is this accumulation of knowledge that allows us to learn to drive a car in 20 hours. If you're using reinforcement learning or supervised learning, uh, let's say reinforcement learning, to train a car to drive itself, it doesn't know a priori that when you drive next to a cliff and you turn the, 
you, you turn the wheel to the, to the right, uh, the car will run off the cliff. It has to do this multiple thousand times before it realizes it's a bad idea. Okay, and then it will realize that it's a bad idea to run off this cliff, but then you will have to relearn again for the next cliff, which looks different. And so that's why those, you know, that's why we don't have self-driving cars, basically. I mean, um, whereas, you know, we as humans have accumulated this knowledge about the world. We know that nothing good is going to come out of running, running off a cliff. And, and we know that we have to stay on the, on the road and, you know, things like that. We have, like, a lot of uh, intuition about how the world works. So we, we can imagine scenarios. So that's the... You know, how do we accumulate this background knowledge? And that's, that's what we need to do with machines. In fact, there is three things we need to get machines to do, which they currently can't do. Uh, the first one is learning to represent the world and predict uh, what's going to happen in the world. Learning to reason, uh, to plan, and, and things like that. Uh, so there is an interesting book by uh, Daniel Kahneman, who is a uh, uh, Nobel Prize in economics. He's a psychologist in Princeton, and, and he describes system one and system two. So system one is the the type of uh, uh, your mind, the part of your brain, mind you use to basically just uh, quickly uh, react to a situation and, and act without uh, thinking consciously. Um, so after a few dozen hours of practice of driving, you can drive without thinking about it, basically. You can talk to someone at the same time. But in the first few hours, you use your entire brain, basically. You focus, you focus on, the, on the task, and that's called system two. So system two is when you do a conscious task and you, um, you, you, you plan and imagine scenarios and stuff like that. And currently, our, our, our deep learning system basically don't do system two. And this is problem of uh, learning to plan complex action sequences, which you know, a dog can do, but, and uh, certainly humans, but all machines can't do. So my solution to this is to use something called self-supervised learning, which is a, another form of learning different from supervised and reinforcement learning that basically we get a machine to learn how the world works by observation, uh, which we, and it would not be a knowledge that is specific to any particular task, but it's kind of generic. You know, you just learn about the world. Uh, and if you want to integrate this into uh, an overall uh, architecture for autonomous intelligence, it would look something like this, where the, the centerpiece of that system is the world model. And what this world model does is that given an estimate of the state of the world, given by perception, okay, so when you perceive, you, you get an idea of what the state of the, of what the world, which state the world is in, perhaps help with uh, memory. Uh, so given the current state of the world and a sequence of action that you can imagine in your head, your world model predicts what's going to happen next. Okay, what would be the result of taking those actions? Or what would be the result of just the world evolving even if I don't take any action? Okay, so that's your world model. And it, uh, in humans, probably it occupies the better part of the front half of the brain. Um, and then you have some way of measuring whether the resulting, uh, the, the resulting condition uh, is good or bad. And that's implemented by a, a cost module. We all have a module at the base of our brain uh, in what's called a basal ganglia that basically computes whether we should be happy or not or whether we should be, you know, uh, uh, elated or scared, things like that. Basically, it computes emotions, and, and those emotions are anticipation of outcomes. So we're scared when we imagine a sequence of action that will result in a bad, in a bad outcome, or when we can't predict really what's going to happen, we get scared. Uh, we get elated when we know that what's going to happen next is going to make something good happen to us, uh, things like that. Um, and so... Um, let me talk about how a system like this could be used to, uh, to do some uh, planning and reasoning. And, so, uh, and, th and this is sort of inspired by really you know, classic work in uh, optimal control. There's something called model predictive control, which is uh, very, very, you know, essentially the same diagram, uh, where you estimate the state of the world, and then you imagine an action, feed it to your world model, which predicts the next state, and then another action, which predicts the next state, etc. And then for each of those states, you can measure the cost of those states. Uh, perhaps, you know, uh, if I grab my phone, that's a, a cost is whether I have my phone in my hand, things like that. Um, and then what the, the system can do in, the, in this uh, mode two is figure out what is the optimal sequence of actions that will minimize my cost according to what my world model is, is, is predicting. 
Okay, so I'm not talking about learning here. I'm talking about inference and planning, uh, where what the, what the system is doing is figure out a good sequence of action that will uh, best satisfy uh, a goal uh, measured by a cost. Um, and, you know, there's a few systems that have been built that are based on this principle, but the, the trick here is, is how you build this world model and how you train it. And that's really kind of the part that a lot of people don't know how to do. And then there's you know, complexity about the, world, the, the cost function. Um, you should tell me when I should stop. Five minutes ago. Okay. Um, okay, so this is about training the world model. Uh, and the problem with training a world model is that you can't, you can't use uh, a, a simple uh, neural net. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so here, here's what happens. Um, all right. You can't use a simple neural net that just makes one prediction because there are many things that can happen in the world, multiple things, multiple future. Like you're looking at me right now. I could be moving to the right or to the left. Uh, I could be turning in one direction or another. And if you have to make one prediction, it's almost certainly going to be false. And so the question is, how do we train a, a system? How do we build a system that can represent multiple outcomes on the output? And it's easy enough if the number of outcomes is discrete. Uh, we can generate a probability distribution over discrete events. But if it's continuous, we actually don't know how to do it. So here's an example. Here is a, a view, a top-down view of a highway with a car in the middle and then other cars kind of moving around. And this is if we train a neural net to, to predict future frames uh, from the first few, you get those blurry predictions. Same for natural video, you get sort of blurry predictions of what's going to happen. And it's because the system has to make one prediction and it predicts the average of all the possible outcomes, and that's not, not good. So the problem we need to solve there is this problem of self-supervised learning. And self-supervised learning really is learning to fill in the blanks. So uh, let's say we have a piece of a video and we make the machine pretend that it doesn't know the rest of the video, and then we uncover the rest of the video and train the machine to uh, tell us if the continuation of that video is a good continuation for the, the initial segment or not. And you know, there's sort of several type of prediction you can make, not just predicting the future, but predicting uh, middle frames or the right from the left or whatever. And for this, we have to abandon a, a staple of machine learning, uh, which is probabilistic modeling, uh, because Probabilistic modeling is basically becomes intractable if we want to apply it to high dimensional continuous uh, systems. So I've been arguing for something called energy-based models, which I'm not going to talk about because I don't have time. Um, but what I want to say is that uh, this type of self-supervised learning is, has been extremely successful in the context of natural language understanding, and in fact has brought about a revolution. And the way this works is that you take a piece of text and you corrupt it by removing some of the words. Okay, so you replace the missing words by a, a blank marker. And, the, and then you train some giant neural net to predict the words that are missing. In the process of doing so, the system will learn something about the world, okay? But because it's only trained from text, it, it doesn't know anything about the underlying reality of the world. Uh, but if you train it with you know, billions and billions of, uh, of text, uh, uh, snippets, it, it sort of has some superficial understanding of, of the world. Uh, uh, because it has to solve this task of filling in the blanks, essentially. And so what you do then is that you use the representation of a text uh, extracted by the system to, uh, as input to uh, a, a downstream task like translation or uh, hate speech detection or, or whatever it is that you want to you do. And this works really well. So this is a very large system that was trained by my colleagues at, at FAIR, and it has 175 billion parameters, adjustable knobs. Yeah. It's one of the largest in the, in the world uh, of that type. Uh, there's, there's another one from OpenAI and a couple from Google as well. Uh, it's been trained with 180 billion words, essentially, tokens that are kind of like words. And that requires enormous supercomputers um, and et cetera. But once you've pre-trained that system to basically complete uh, blanks and text, uh, it works really well for doing things like hate speech detection or various tasks in uh, natural language processing or dialogue systems or translation, et cetera. Um, this is a, a simulated dialogue by one of the systems. So you type a prompt, you, you type this text, okay, which is in bold, and then you let the system predict the, the next word recursively, and it basically continues the dialogue. This is a 
dialogue between the Statue of Liberty and the person. It's kind of funny. It works really well also for translations. Uh, this is an open source system that was produced, again, by some of my colleagues called NLLB, No Language Left Behind. And it's a system that can translate uh, 202 languages from in any direction, so f f over 40,000 uh, directions. Uh, it's been trained with 80 billion pairs of sentences, but they only cover uh, 2,400 language directions. So the data set does not cover all 40,000 language directions, only about 2,000 and, and 400. And it's a single neural net, 54 billion parameters. You can download it. And those are the languages that you can translate from each other. Some of them are what's called low resource languages for which there is a small amount of uh, training data. Uh, like, uh, I don't know if you know this one, for example. Uh, but, you know, 200 languages is a lot of languages. Ayacucho Krisha, that's uh, in uh, South America, I think. Uh, I mean, there's various dialects. And some, some of them appear twice because there's two ways to write them. So. Um, so, unfortunately, this doesn't work for images. For images, we can't use this trick of removing parts of the image and then training the system to complete. And it's because images are continuous. We know how to do this for text because it's kind of a discrete data, but for, for continuous data, we don't know. For continuous data, we have to, we have to use what's called uh, a joint embedding architecture. So a joint embedding architecture is an architecture which does not attempt to predict things, but attempts to find a representation of things so that uh, two similar views of the same image, for example, will produce similar representations. Uh, so that's called joint embedding. The idea goes back to the 1990s. Actually, that's one of my papers. But um, it's sort of been uh, recycled more recently, and it's become so much successful to pre-train systems in a self-supervised manner to recognize images. So you take two images that are distortions of each other. You tell the system, produce identical representations for them. And then you take two images that you know are different, and then you push the representations away from each other. That's called contrastive learning. And uh, that works pretty well for images. Uh, it improves the performance of recognition systems if you, if you pre-train them on lots and lots of images, like a billion images, for example, things like that. It works really well for speech recognition. You can build a speech recognition system now with only 10 minutes of transcribed speech, uh, which means now you can have speech recognition systems that are multilingual and work in you know, hundreds of languages and uh, can recognize uh, rare languages for which there is not a lot of training data. So this is really amazing. Um, but the stuff that is the most exciting, I think, is uh, new methods that are called regularized method with a joint embedding predictive architecture. Since I can't show you any results on this, really, I mean, I have some results for image recognition, but they're not that exciting. This is really a work in progress. I've written a position paper um, about like, how this could be used for building world predictors, if you want, world models. Uh, and I encourage you to read it if you're interested. But I'm going to go to the conclusion. Um, OK, so steps towards autonomous AI. Um, Self-supervised learning is, in my opinion, going to be the necessary step for that. And we're going to have to figure out how to apply this to video so that we can just plug a giant neural net on YouTube and have it watch YouTube all day and figure out how the world works from watching YouTube. Um, what? Not TikTok. Um, uh, and for that, we have to discover new architectures that can handle the uncertainty in the <coughs> prediction in the world because the world is not entirely predictable. So this JEPA architecture, Joint Embedding Predictive Architecture, I think is a way to do this. Uh, and we have to abandon the idea that we have to do probabilistic modeling because it's intractable. And so I'm uh, arguing for this energy-based model framework, um, which I didn't have time to explain. And uh, with that, we might be able to get machines to learn world models from observation, perhaps like like maybe animals and, and humans. And they will be able to use it for planning in the kind of architecture that I described earlier, and perhaps even um, uh, hierarchical planning. Now, in this architecture that I showed, there is something at the top here called the configurator. And what this does is that it configures the, the rest of the system towards the task that the system needs to focus on at the moment. We have a thing like this in our brain. Uh, we can only focus on one conscious task at any one time. Uh, and, you know, we can, we can do a lot of subconscious tasks simultaneously, but a conscious task we can only do one at a time, and it's because we basically have only one world model engine 
in our front, frontal cortex. Uh, it's configurable for the situation at hand, but we only, only have one, so we need to configure it for the situation at hand, and we can only attend to the situation in question. And so that's a hypothesis for why, you know, what consciousness is, uh, which is kind of a crazy hypothesis, really, uh, more of a speculation. Um, we need uh, a system that is able to configure our brain for the situation at hand, and because we only have one uh, world simulator, world model that's configurable, uh, uh, we can only attend to a single conscious task at any one time. Okay, prediction is the essence of intelligence. Almost everything is learned, probably through SSL. Intrinsic cost is what drives behavior and determine what an agent learns. Uh, and that's an interesting point. Emotions are necessary for autonomous intelligence. So uh, emotions, as I said earlier, are anticipation of outcomes by the, the cost function, if you want. And so if we build machines according to this blueprint that are relatively autonomous in terms of their intelligence, they will have those cost functions and, and predictors, and they will have to have emotions because of that. It's, so I think emotions are uh, in, inseparable from autonomous intelligence. A self-driving car will probably will not have much emotion, but, um, but your intelligent assistant probably will. Uh, and there's no question that machines will eventually be as smart as humans. Uh, it will take a while, um, and they won't want to take over the world. You know, it's not like in science fiction. You know, it makes for good science fiction scenarios, but it's very unlikely in reality because we can design their intrinsic costs so that their motivations and their values are aligned with uh, human values. Thank you very much. <laughs>